I dropped softly from the plank and peeped out with the rest. They stood by the fence on the opposite side of the street, a bit up towards the railway station, with their portmanteau and bundles at their feet. One girl leant with her arms on the fence rail and her face buried in them. Another was trying to comfort her. The third girl and the woman stood facing our way. The woman was good-looking. She had a hard face, but it might have been made hard. The third girl seemed half defiant, half inclined to cry. Presently, she went to the other side of the girl who was crying on the fence and put her arm around her shoulder. The woman suddenly turned her back on us and stood looking away over the paddocks. The hat went round. Billy Woods was first, then Box of Tricks, and then Mitchell. Billy contributed with eloquent silence. I was only joking, Giraffe, said Box of Tricks, dredging his pockets for a couple of shillings. It was some time after the shearing, and most of the chaps were hard up. Ah, oh, well, sighed Mitchell, there's no help for it. If the giraffe would take up a collection to import some decent girls to this god-forgotten hole, there might be some sense in it. It's bad enough for the giraffe to undermine our religious prejudices, and tempt us to take a morbid interest in sick chows and Afghans and black legs and widows, but when he starts mixing us up with strange women, it's time to buck and he prospected his pockets and contributed two shillings, some odd pennies, and a pinch of tobacco dust. "'I don't mind helping the girls, but I'm damned if I'll give a penny to help the old—' said Tom Hall. "'Well, she was a girl once herself,' drawled the giraffe. The giraffe went round to the other pubs and to the union offices, and when he returned he seemed satisfied with the plate, but troubled about something else. I don't know what to do for them tonight, he said. None of the pubs or boarding houses will hear of em, and there ain't no empty houses, and the women is all again em. Not all, said Alice, the big handsome barmaid from Sydney. Come here, Bob. She gave the giraffe half a sovereign and a look for which some of us would have paid ten pounds, had we the money and had the look been transferable. Wait a minute, Bob, she said, and she went in to speak to the landlord. There's an empty bedroom at the end of the store in the yard, she said when she came back. They can camp there for tonight, if they behave themselves. You'd better tell them, Bob. Thank you, Alice, said the giraffe. Next day, after work, the giraffe and I drifted together and down by the river in the cool of the evening and sat on the edge of the steep, drought-parched bank. I heard you saw your lady friends off this morning, Bob, I said, and was sorry I said it, even before he answered. Oh, they ain't no friends of mine, he said. Only four poor devils of women. I thought they mightn't like to stand waiting with the crowd on the platform, so I just offered to get their tickets and told them to wait round the back of the station till the bell rung. And what do you think they did, Harry? He went on with an exasperatingly unintelligent grin. Why, they wanted to kiss me. Did they? Yes. And they would have done it too if I hadn't been so long. Why, I'm blessed if they didn't kiss me hands. You don't say so. God's truth. Somehow I didn't like to go on the platform with them after that. Besides, they was crying. And I can't stand women crying. But some of the chaps put them into an empty carriage. He thought a moment. Then, there's some terrible good-hearted fellas in the world, he reflected. I thought so too. Bob, I said, you're a single man. Why don't you get married and settle down? Well, he said, I ain't got no wife and kids, that's a fact. But it ain't my fault. He may have been right about the wife. But I thought of the look that Alice had given him, and... Girls seem to like me right enough, he said. But I don't go no further than that. The trouble is that I'm so long and I always seem to get shook after little girls. At least there was one little girl in Bendigo that was properly gone on. And wouldn't she have you? Well, it seems not. Did you ask her? Oh, yes. I asked her right enough. Well, and what did she say? She said it'd be ridiculous for her to be seen trotting alongside of a chimney like me. Perhaps she didn't mean that. There are any amount of little women who like tall men. I thought of that, too, afterwards. 
Perhaps she didn't mean it that way. I suppose the fact of the matter was that she didn't cotton on to me and wanted to let me down easy. She didn't want to hurt me feelings, if you understand. She was a very good-hearted little girl. There's some terrible tall fellows where I come from, and I know two as married little girls. He seemed a hopeless case. Sometimes, he said, sometimes I wish I wasn't so blessed long. Is that there deaf jackaroo? He reflected presently. He's something in the same fix about girls as I am. He's too deaf and I'm too long. How do you make that out? I asked. He's got three girls, to my knowledge, and as for being deaf, why, he gasses more than any man in the town, and knows more of what's going on than old Mother Brindle the washerwoman. Well, look at that now, said the giraffe slowly. Who'd have thought it? He never told me he had three girls, and as for hearing news, I always tell him anything that's going on that I think he doesn't catch. He told me his trouble was that whenever he went out with a girl, people could hear what they were saying. At least they could hear what she was saying to him, and draw their own conclusions, he said. He said he went out one night with a girl, and some of the chaps foxed him and heard her saying, Don't, to him, and put it all around town. What did she say don't for, I asked. He didn't tell me that, but I suppose he was kissing or hugging her or something. Bob, I said presently, didn't you try the little girl in Bendigo a second time? No, he said. What was the use? She was a good little girl, and I wasn't going to go bothering her. I ain't the sort of cove that goes hanging around when he isn't wanted. But somehow I couldn't stay about Bendigo after she gave me the hint, so I thought I'd come over and have a knock round on this side for a year or two. And you never wrote to her? No. What was the use of going pestering her at letters? I know what trouble letters give me when I have to answer one. She'd have only had to tell me the straight truth in a letter, and it wouldn't have done me any good. But I've pretty well got over it by this time. A few days later, I went to Sydney. The giraffe was the last I shook hands with from the carriage window, and he slipped something in a piece of paper into my hand. I hope you won't be offended, he drawled. Some of the chaps thought you mightn't be too flush of stuff. You've been shouting a good deal, so they put a quid or two together. I thought it might help you to have a bit of a fly around in Sydney. I was back in Burke before next cheering. On the evening of my arrival, I ran against the giraffe. He seemed strangely shaken over something, but he kept his hat on his head. Would you mind taking a stroll as far as the billabong? He said. I've got something I'd like to tell you. His big brown sunburnt hands trembled and shook as he took a letter from his pocket and opened it. I've just got a letter, he said. A letter from that little girl at Bendigo. Seems it was all a mistake. I'd like you to read it. Somehow I feel as if I'd want to talk to a fellow, and I'd rather talk to you than any of them other chaps. It was a good letter from a big-hearted little girl. She'd been breaking her heart for the great ass all these months. It seemed that he had left Bendigo without saying goodbye to her. Somehow I couldn't bring myself to it, he said when I taxed him with it. She had never been able to get his address until last week, and then she got it from a Burke man who had gone south. She called him an awful long fool, which he was, without the slightest doubt, and she implored him to write and come back to her. And will you go back, Bob? I asked. My oath. I'll take the train tomorrow, only I ain't got the stuff. But I've got a stand in Big Billabong Shed, and I'll soon knock a few quid together. I'll go back as soon as ever shearing's over. I'm going to ride away to her tonight. The giraffe was the ringer of Big Billabong Shed that season. His tallies averaged a hundred and twenty a day. He only sent his hat round once during shearing, and it was noticed that he hesitated at first and only contributed half a crown. But then it was a case of a man being taken from the shed by the police for wife desertion. It's always that way, commented Mitchell. Those soft, good-hearted fellows always end up by getting hard and selfish. The world makes them so. 
It's the thought of the soft fools they've been that finds out sooner or later and makes em repent. Like as not the giraffe will be the meanest man out back before he's done. When Big Billabong cut out and we got back to Burke with our dusty swags and dirty checks, I spoke to Tom Hall. Look here, Tom, I said. That long fool the giraffe has been breaking his heart for a little girl in Bendigo ever since he's been out back, and she's been breaking her heart for him, and the ass didn't know it till he got a letter from her just before Big Billabong started. He's going home tomorrow. That evening, Tom stole the giraffe's hat. I suppose it'll turn up in the morning, said the giraffe. I don't mind the lark, he added. But it does seem a bit red hot for the chaps to collar a cave's hat and a fella going away for good, perhaps, in the morning. Mitchell started the thing going with a quid. It's worth it, he said, to get rid of him. We'll have some peace now. There won't be so many accidents or women in trouble when the giraffe and his blessed hat are gone. Anyway, he's an eyesore in the town and he's getting on my nerves for one. Come on, you sinners, chuck em in. We're only taking quids and half quids. About daylight next morning, Tom Hall slipped into the giraffe's room at the carrier's arms. The giraffe was sleeping peacefully. Tom put the hat on a chair by his side. The collection had been a record one, and, besides the packet of money in the crown of the hat, there was a silver-mounted pipe with case, the best that could be bought in Burke, a gold brooch and several trifles besides an ugly valentine of a long man in his shirt walking the room with a twin on each arm. Tom was about to shake the giraffe by the shoulder when he noticed a great foot with about half a yard of big boned ankle and shank sticking out at the bottom of the bed. The temptation was too great. Tom took up the hairbrush and with the back of it he gave a sharp rap on the point of an ingrowing toenail and slithered. We heard the giraffe swearing good-naturedly for a while, and then there was a pregnant silence. He was staring at the hat, we supposed. We were all up at the station to see him off. It was rather a long wait. The giraffe edged me up to the other end of the platform. He seemed overcome. There's... there's some terrible good-hearted fellows in this world, he said. You mustn't forget them, Harry, when you make a big name right and... I'm... Well, I'm blessed if I don't feel as if I was just going to blubber. I was glad he didn't. The giraffe blubbering would have been a spectacle. I steered him back to his friends. Ain't you going to kiss me, Bob? said the great Weston's big handsome barmaid as the bell rang. Well, I don't mind kissing you, Alice, he said, wiping his mouth. But I'm going to be married, you know. And he kissed her fair on the mouth. There's nothing like getting into practice, he said, grinning around. We thought he was improving wonderfully, but at the last moment something troubled him. Look here, you chaps, he said hesitatingly with his hand in his pocket. I don't know what I'm going to do with all this stuff. There's that there poor washerwoman that scalded her legs, lifting the boiler of clothes off the fire. We shoved him into the carriage. He hung, about half of him, out the window wildly waving his hat till the train disappeared in the scrub. And, as I sit here, writing by lamplight at midday, in the midst of a great city of shallow social sham, of hopeless squalid poverty, of ignorant selfishness, cultured or brutish, and of noble and heroic endeavour, frowned down or callously neglected, I am almost aware of a burst of sunshine in the room, and a long form leaning over my chair, and Excuse me for troubling you. I'm always troubling you. But there's that there poor woman. And I wish I could immortalise him. End of Send Round the Hat by Henry Lawson